All right, welcome back to Racing Rundown. Uh, we're live right now with Tom Durkin, Legendary New York Racing Association track announcer. Uh, Tom, how are you doing today? Very good, very good. Good for uh, ready for the races today. So I guess the first question that I have to ask you, that I really ask all my guests that I bring on here, is how did you get started in horse racing? Well, just going to the track. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, when I was a kid, we used to sneak away, and uh, my dad took me a few times, and uh, so I started, you know, I guess 13, 14 years old, going to the track. When did you first decide that you wanted to be a track announcer? Probably around that time, uh, there was a uh, very exciting announcer in Chicago. His name was Phil Georgeff, great guy, great announcer. And, uh, you know, I'm not real horsey. I don't really uh, uh, get around horses that much. Uh, I mean, I love them, but I don't really uh, have physical contact with them so much. Um, but I certainly appreciate what they do. And, and I uh, enjoyed the uh, excitement of racing and the uh, competition of it. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of my background, uh, even genetically, I'm Irish. You know, we love to tell stories. Uh, Irish people love horses, so for that matter. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose my personality is a little theatrical. Um, it was always, you know, class show off and things like that. And um, it, it, uh, it was just something that uh, I really wanted to do. I didn't waste much time doing anything else. Other, uh, you know, and my, I didn't have any career path uh, outlined other than that, really. Now, you started out calling uh, quarter horse races. How different would you say quarter horse racing is than, to thoroughbred racing? Well, I didn't start out calling quarter horse races. I started out calling... Uh, any horse that would run <laughs> at these fairs in Wisconsin. Some of them were quarter horses and some were thoroughbreds. Some were mixed breeds and whatever. But a quarter horse, uh, I did call a quarter horse meet in a strictly quarter horse uh, at uh, Miles Park, the old Miles Park uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they had a, a quarter horse meet there uh, one year. And, uh, you know, quarter, they run a quarter of a mile, you know, basically. And it's just really, really fast. And it's really, really close. <laughs> uh, and there's really no strategy. You just, the gates open and you just go as fast as you can. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's very popular in the Southwest, uh, you know, where people, where quarter horses are, you know, they, um, they have a, a sense of history with them. You know, that they're, they're great horses, uh, uh, for ranching and things like that. Um, and, you know, I never really got the attraction uh, of betting on it because it's just uh, it's just over so quick, 10, 12 seconds, you know. And then they do have different, you know, uh, races. Some of them are, uh, uh, you know, 200 yards long. Some of them are, you know, even three furlongs, sometimes a little bit longer than that, you know. So um, it's just too short for my liking. Now, uh, what year did you start working at Tampa Bay uh, Downs? Because I had Julie Crone on here, and actually, uh, she told me that you called her first winning ride. Yes. Uh, I think her was, was it 1981 when she won her first race? Yeah, uh, she said it was 1981. Yeah, horse called, I still remember the horse, Lord Farkle. And, uh, but I started in Tampa in 1977. And from what point... Uh, did you start to gain national prominence? Uh, first Breeders' Cup, really, 1984. Um, I, gosh, I was just a youngster, I guess I was 33 years old. And um, I had called a, a few races on national TV at Hialeah and got some exposure there. I was also at that time calling races at the Meadowlands, primarily harness racing, but some thoroughbreds. And Arthur Watson, uh, who lived near the Meadowlands, was the president of NBC Sports. And um, they were all set to hire somebody else. And Arthur said, why well, don't I give this guy a listen? And God love him, they hired me. And that was that. 
What were your thoughts going into the first Breeders' Cup? Did you think that it was going to become something that it, or the thing that it ended up becoming, or was it just something that you thought, you know, this is a cool idea, let's see how it eventually plays out? That was about it. You know, it was so, it was such an orgy of money. It was just inconceivable. You have to realize, at that point, there may have been only two $1 million races in the country, the Arlington Million being one, and I think maybe the Santa Anita Handicap being the other, but that was it. I'm not even sure the Derby was a $1 million at that point. And um, to have both ends of the double be $1 million races was uh, absurd, and the thought of a $3 million race, oh, good Lord, you know. So that was the big thing going into it that day, but... I think things kind of got into focus very quickly. Uh, the first race was the juvenile. And prior to that, horses of the year and all the divisional titles were just votes. And frequently you'd have horses, uh, you know, a good horse on the West Coast, good horse on the East Coast, good horse in the middle of the country. And, and you just, you know, they didn't really run in each other it's not like the super bowl where you have you know two teams and the winner's the champion that this they compete and the winner's the champion so there was no on the track for the most part you know but there were races that you know like uh certain years the woodward of the jockey cup gold cup would be uh the uh determining factor uh whatever but um in the first race, it was the uh, juvenile, and uh, Chiefs Crown won. And the announcer, it was probably the first time any announcer could say it, uh, a champion is crowned. And uh, that's what I said when Chiefs Crown crossed the finish line. A champion is crowned, and it's Chiefs Crown. And I think, you know, that's when it sunk in for me anyway, that, yeah, these are championship events taking place you know, and if you win, you're the champ. And uh, it, it became that. Now, I will say the general idea of the Breeders' Cup when it was first started out, the general idea was that it was going to be a marketing vehicle for horse racing, that it was that, that the money was so huge that it had to be taken into consideration by the general public and by television in particular. NBC paid a million dollars for the rights to the Breeders' Cup. Now it's almost the other way around. But uh, they wanted it to be, you know, to put all the best horses and all the best trainers and jockeys in one place at one time and showcase horse racing. And they thought that the, uh, the ratings would be uh, huge and whatever. Ratings never got huge. Um, it still remained a championship event, but it became uh, a real business vehicle where now, you know, the handle is what, $100 million or something like that. Um, I think the handle on opening the first Breeders' Cup was $2.5 million, something like that. I don't know. But uh, now it's just it's just become a huge day uh, handle-wise. It's a big day at all the tracks around the country. Uh it's one of the most popular betting days, and people go to their local racetrack and bet and watch and whatever. That's what it's become, and it was not the original intent of the Breeders' Cup to do that. It was just a case of uh, unexpected uh, returns. What were some of the best moments, in your opinion, uh, in those early Breeders' Cups? Well, the first day was just spectacular. The very first day, I mean, you had Chiefs Crown there, uh, you had uh, that unbelievable Breeders' Cup Classic with Wild Again Gate Dancer and Slew of Gold, uh, 35 to one shot, you know, wins. Uh, the guys had to pay $350,000 to get a 30 to one shot in the race. You won them $1.3 million for winning the race. They were taking seven to two on a 30 to one shot. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and they cashed. And, um, yeah, and that stretch drive was, uh, uh, you know, memorable. Uh, it's, it still plays well, you know, 
30 years later, 35 years later. In 1991, you were given the position at track announcer for the New York Racing Association. How excited were you to become the main track announcer taking over for Marshall Cassidy? Well, I was thrilled to death. Uh, at that point, I was uh, uh, the, the announcer at Hialeah and the main harness announcer at the metal end the sport that sport was great the metal ends harness at that time was just unbelievable and uh, also i was the backup for dave johnson during the third red meet in the fall uh but uh, that's the number one job in the country it still remains the number one job in the country and uh to have that was life-changing uh to have the opportunity to you know call the races at saratoga and Belmont and you know, the history involved there, the level of the competition, uh, it was a giant, giant leap for me. Now, you've said before your the favorite your favorite race call ever was Cigar in the 1995 Breeders' Cup Classic. What, what do you like so much about that race call? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> when I was retiring, I got answered, asked that question constantly, constantly, and, I, and I, my answer for about the first month was, you know, I don't really have one, and I don't really have one, and and then I just, you know, gave up, on it, and I just, okay, Breeders Cup, Cigars, Breeders Cup, or whatever, people were familiar with it, and, you know, but there were a lot of other races that, uh, frankly, were on a par with that in terms of my uh, uh, good feelings about uh, the, the competitions and how exciting they were, how important they were. Uh, cigar, well, you know, I mean, he was really... Uh, it's hard to uh, underestimate uh, how popular he was, um, and um, you know, he, I think he won ten for ten or eleven for eleven that year. And um, you know, they they had him at Madison Square Garden make an appearance. Uh, uh, you know, he was just a horse of a great renown, and um, he ran a great race that day. Now, you also, during your time with the New York Racing Association, went through eight failed attempts at the Triple Crown. Uh, which one, from your perspective, was the most surprising of the defeats? Smarty Jones. I was so convinced that he was going to win. The night before, uh, I got a, uh, it's called a surveyor's wheel, and it measures distances. Uh, from one point to another and I thought you know he might win by more than 31 lengths which is the uh, great secretary at Belmont winning margin so I marched off uh, 31 lengths and uh, there was some formula I guess it's 8.7 feet uh, per length something like that and then I took a piece of red tape and put it on the rail night before so uh if smarty jones uh was gonna win by more than secretariat i could say that uh well turns out there was no need <laughs> you know i've always said that you more than any other track announcer are the best at conveying the mood of the racing fan what were coming into your mind when smarty jones was in front by a pretty s significant margin, and as Birdstone was grinding it out and reeling him in, did you? When did you realize that Birdstone was going to win that race? Mm, kind of hard to say. Uh, probably the eighth pole, but that race was lost when they went into the backstretch. They went the third quarter. Uh, he went the third quarter in that race in twenty-two and two, something like that, which was preposterous. Uh, and that's when his, his goose was cooked at that point. You can't run any fraction in a mile and a quarter race, let alone the third quarter, with six furlongs left to go. I mean, you know, game over. Or that was a mile and a half race, no, no less. Yeah. Now, I want to go back a couple of years to 1998. Uh, Real Quiet was going for the Triple Crown, and there was the photo finish very very hard to tell what horse had won there was also the inquiry that came on and it has been said that had real quiet's nose been in front 
on the wire, he would have been disqualified. Uh, so you would have had the pleasure of being the first track announcer to announce a disqualification in a Triple Crown race and a disqualification that would have taken away a Triple Crown, no less. Uh, we actually have Travis Stone coming on tomorrow. He got that pleasure this year. But uh, what were you thinking during the photo sign and the deliberation, the inquiry, that you were, were you thinking, oh God, I'm going to possibly have to announce a, a real quiet disqualification? Uh, well, no, because his, uh, you know, the right number went up and, um, uh, you know, I was just waiting. I was just waiting at that point to see, it took 12 minutes for them to put that number up. Uh, and then, you know, then they had the, and by the way, that business about they were going to take down the number, one of the stewards inadvisedly said that the next day, they would have not have taken that, not, not that I, I do not believe that they would have taken that number down. Easy to say for them after the fact. I've kind of felt that too, but uh, just going by what they said. Uh, mm. Now, I want to ask you about uh, the 2001 Breeders' Cup. What was it like to be there at Belmont Park uh, with that atmosphere, with you know the country just going through the biggest tragedy in its history less than two months earlier? What was the atmosphere like mm -hmm. there that day? Well, I live in the floor, lived in Floral Park, uh, which is where the track is located. Uh, Floral Park is the first suburb. Uh, it's right next to Queens. In fact, part of the Belmont Park is in Queens, and uh, most of it is in uh, Floral Park, Long Island, and Elmont, Long Island. And uh, it particularly affected people in uh, my neighborhood it's uh, there's a stop in floral park for the uh, long island railroad and uh, it's again it's a close proximity to uh, new york city uh, many uh, first responders a lot of cops a lot of firemen lived in my neighborhood 33 people from my parish died uh, in that 9-11 uh, attack 33 and uh, at that point they were still having funerals you know these bodies were never recovered and you you know the they'd, uh, the firemen would uh, put uh, a hearse uh, if you were a casket on a back of one of the fire trucks and take them you know ceremonially because there were no bodies and you just stopped every day when these cortages went by and it was just uh it really affected people in the uh in the neighborhood right there uh and you know it was weird i mean there were uh you know getting on the elevator and you got a guy elevated with a guy in the swat gear you know and they were all over the place they had a, a nest in the infield uh, uh they were on the roof and it was just a very weird uh situation now, also in that Breeders' Cup, uh, the American horses did not particularly do very well. Bobby Frankel got his Breeders' Cup win, and it was all Europe for the rest of that whole day. Uh, but Tiz now, the reigning horse of the year, was running in the Classic that year. And uh, he, he'd been kind of going through a rough period, had not won since earlier in the year. What were your thoughts going into that race call when uh, Tiz now was in front and he was battling hard with the European Saki who had won the arc earlier in the year. Uh -huh. Well, you just keep your eye on uh, on what's happening and just, you know, basically, you know, my job is to accurately describe what's going on. So, um, and, and then, but then every, everything is in context. I mean, this was, you know, it was 9-11 uh, was on everybody's mind and, uh, um, you know, you you know, there's a lot of patriotism going on at that point. I don't think uh, it was a particularly uh, jingoistic call, uh, saying he wins it for America. But that's what everybody was thinking, and that was part of the story. And so it was my job to tell the story. Uh, also, uh, while you had your tenure with NBC, uh, you, you did have some tragedies happen while you were calling them. Of the ones that you did, uh, were there for, what was the most shocking of all them? 
I'll go for Wand. I mean, that was horrible, horrible. Uh, and it happened right before the finish line, and it was, it was just ghastly. It was just the worst thing I've ever seen on a racetrack. And uh, I literally uh, put down the mic and went in the corner and started crying. I mean, it was just ghastly. But um, the next race was the mile, and uh, Royal Academy uh, won that. And the uh, show went on. You know, a half hour later, you know, you, you had to get it together. And uh, so that, you know, just uh, trying to wipe that out. And there was a pall over the, the entire uh, proceedings after that, as you would expect, and, and rightly so. But yeah, that, 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 that was the darkest uh, moment in my career. What was it like uh, when you were at the Preakness in 2006 and Barbara, who was very likely going to win the Triple Crown that year, pulled up and uh, was stricken on the backside, or to stricken uh, in the stretch? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that was first time round uh, when he pulled up. And at that point, I had two narratives. You know, I had uh, a Preakness <laughs> unfolding. And I had the drama of Barbaro unfolding right beneath me. Uh, it was directly below me at that point. And there was uh, a danger of if Barbaro, you know, were to get loose or, or uh, uh, you know, there could be, uh, the, you know, it was a tragic uh, event, uh, tragic as it was. Uh, you didn't know uh, how serious that injury was. Um, you didn't know if it was fatal. You didn't, just didn't know, but it was. So I had to keep people uh, going. So I had two different uh, calls going on at the same time. Now, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit to a lighter subject. You are famous for going with the race and making even the most insignificant race call seem like it, it, it's the most important race that's happening in the day. Uh, one of your most famous calls is uh, an allowance race at Saratoga. There was a horse called Arg. Uh, how fun was it to play out that name, calling that race? <laughs> well, you know, you you name a horse like that, and you know, come on, you you you, 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 you know, they had a horse called Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti Do. Now, how do you let that just lay there? You know, have a little fun with it. Come on, you know, lighten up. Jeez, guys. And, you know, a couple of people, oh, you should never do that. Yeah, fine. You know, go, have a nice day if you know how to have a nice day. Uh, and Ark was fun, you know. And, and it got to the point where uh, that year it, it became sort of like a mem. Uh, and people walking down the Broadway in Saratoga, instead of greeting each other, uh, they would go, Ark. First go, Ark. <laughs> yeah, it was just a lot of fun. Now, I believe like uh, something like a week after that call, there was another horse that, <clears throat> excuse me, won an allowance race named Slambino. Slambino was 88 to 1, and you, after that race call, yelled, he's 88 to 1. Were you yelling, like, did you actually not know how high the odds were on that horse? Uh, well, I knew he was a long shot. Yeah, I mean, I you know, but I looked over at the board and, and picked it up. Same thing with Arkan, uh, when he won the Breeders' Cup. Uh, classic, uh, uh, yeah, and it's funny about Slambino. You have no idea how many people have come up to me and say, you know, I had Slambino that day. If as many people has come up to me and said, you know, I had Slambino that day, he would have been one to ten. <laughs> <laughs> so you think there's a little bit of, of falsehood in those? Uh, I had. Oh, no, you, you think? <laughs> I, I de definitely someone had it, but uh, probably not as many people had it as claimed to. No question. Uh, when did you decide that uh, 2014 was going to be your last season as a race car for New York Racing Association? Uh, yes, uh, that happened uh, in. Uh, I had one more year left on my contract. I was supposed to call through 15, and uh, it was my custom at that time to go to Italy for about two months a year, sometimes three. 
And so I was over in Italy, and I had a bunch of friends of mine uh, staying there, 10 or 12 of them, actually. And uh, I really wasn't so anxious to get back to work. Uh, I always was really anxious to get back to work. And that spring, it just, you know, I wasn't feeling it. And I thought, you know, if you're not feeling this, you're not going to be at your best. And, and I was going back and forth and back and forth with the whole idea. And so uh, this was in March. And uh, uh, we, were, uh, we were taking a group uh, trip to a town called Cortona in Tuscany. And I said, you know, you guys go, I'm going to stay at home today. And, uh, you know, I got something I got to think through. And, you know, by the end of the day, I, uh, accompanied by a couple glasses of uh, Chianti, I can tell you, uh, decided that, you know, uh, if I could, I would back out of my uh, final year on that contract, which Chris K was uh, nice enough to let me do. Uh, going into your last race, what were... What were your thoughts as the horses were? It, it was a very wet day at Saratoga, and it was the spinaway stakes. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you focused on the race call and didn't say, uh, this is my last race, or this is my last call during the race. But, you know, during the stretch, did the memories of your career come to you as they were running down? No. <laughs> I, was, I was just calling the race. I, you know, it's, yeah, no, I uh, never, never came across my mind at that point. Now, uh, one other thing is the next year, uh, American Pharaoh ca came on and won the Triple Crown. Did you ever, like, say, oh, darn, I missed the Triple Crown winner by a year? <laughs> no, not at all. No, that, I, I mean, uh, not for a second, really. I, I wasn't at the track for that. I, I was at the track for the undercard. and uh, But I had to be in uh, Goshen, New York, uh, upstate New York, uh, to... Uh, give a seminar of race calling of all things early the next morning so getting out of belmont is impossible on belmont day so uh i left uh, early before the belmont and uh, listened to it on the radio i was in a traffic jam on the new york state Thruway <laughs> when the call came through but no i no, no i i had i mean uh um uh, horse racing owes me nothing you know i mean i it uh I had so many wonderful uh, decades uh, in it, and uh, and I, I really uh, not calling a triple crown winner does uh, doesn't move my needle an inch. Uh, Tom Durkin does have to get going pretty soon. Uh, the last question I want to ask you, I ask all my guests this question, but uh -huh. if you could go back in time to any moment in the history of horse racing and be there to witness it live, uh, what moment would you do? Oh, if I could go back and witness it live. Um, Secretary, it's Belmont. Uh, I was calling races at the county fair that day. <laughs> and I actually never saw Secretary run live. Um, I did have an opportunity to uh, visit him. Uh, I was with my buddy Steve. This would have been 1974. Four, I guess. We went to Claiborne Farm, and uh, I had Secretary down a shank. It was throwing my life, and uh, my buddy Steve. I said, "Gotta, gotta take this picture. Gotta take this picture." So uh, that was when you know you took pictures to get developed, and you, you get them a week later. So I couldn't wait all week long. Uh, I got my picture with Secretary to get the picture back, and he's got me and fifty acres of Kentucky and Secretary not a, not in the picture. <laughs> But I really would have liked to have seen that performance. I think it remains the greatest uh, performance by Thurber ever. That is our most popular question. Uh, actually, I have not released my interview that I had with Jay Pridman yet, but uh, just a little sneak peek. Jay told me a story that when he was he was 12 when Secretariat ran in the Belmont Stakes, he hated Secretariat. And he was at his uh, youth baseball game, and he was in the batting cage, and his friend comes and yells at him, Jay Secretary just won the Triple Crown, and he was a big sham guy, so he said, big deal. And so Jay gave me that answer. He uh, said that he would want to be there to witness Secretary live because he kind of missed out on Secretary with him not being a fan of Secretary. But yeah. anyway, Tom Durkin, thank you for coming on. I always appreciate uh, people that I can just go up to at Saratoga and ask for an interview. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. 
Oh, well, thank you uh, for, uh, you know, your, your good work. You, you were very, uh, uh, very informed and, uh, and did a lot of research, and uh, kudos to you. Have a good day. Good luck at the races. Okay, Jack. Thanks. Bye-bye.